Hello and welcome to our webinar, The Three Things You Need to Know When Assessing Database Scalability. My name is Samantha Kelly and I'll be moderating today's webinar. I'm joined here by Rafe Kassam, the Chief Technology Officer at NuoDB. In this webinar, Arif will review scaling options for databases, what it means to trade off consistency for scalability, and the differences between strongly consistent scaling strategies. At the end of today's webinar, we'll open it up for Q&A. Before we begin, I'd like to review a few logistics. Our webinar will last about 45 minutes. The webinar will be recorded and the video and slides will be made available for replay. Attendees will be muted during today's call. However, you may submit questions at any time during the presentation using the question box in the GoToWebinar control panel. So with that, I'll turn it over to Arif. Thanks, Sam. Good morning or uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, as, uh, as Sam mentioned, uh, our agenda for today is to talk through database scalability, uh, the options for database scalability, uh, considerations for consistency and other trade-offs that you need to consider as you sort of think through uh, how to scale your database. So we'll generally start with sort of a very high level view of, of, of the holy grail of, of database availability and scalability. Um, go through the various options uh, that are available out there in the market today and, and sort of go through, as, as we go through each of the options, talk about some of the trade-offs uh, for each of these options and then summarize those trade-offs um, uh, near the end. And then finally, we'll do a very brief overview about new ODB, and then we'll open it up for, for questions and answers. So uh, I'm sure everybody on the call uh, is, is listening in on the call because they are very familiar with, with database um, availability and scalability issues. Um, the, it is common that database uh, performance and scalability have always been a challenge for, for organizations. Um, and for existing sort of traditional uh, older style uh, databases, it's, it's an accepted fact that uh, in order to have a robust uh, solution, you need to throw uh, hardware and software to, to sort of deliver against uh, performance requirements and availability requirements. However, over the last few years, the five, 10 years, um, there's been a lot of innovation in the database uh, market. Significant um, technologies have been introduced uh, to the database space, and, and there's a lot of choice out there today um, around databases and what you can use for for your applications for different use cases and different uh, sort of transactional and consistency models. Um, so what I want to try to do today is sort of walk through and sort of categorize those different um, uh, options that are available to you and sort of talk through these innovations um, and the trade-offs that they need to make. At the end of the day, these innovations uh, ultimately provide a better availability and scalability uh, for your database and typically at a lower TCO. But um, as always, nothing comes for free. So you need to sort of think about uh, your application, your business requirements, your, your drivers, and try to select uh, the technologies that best suit uh, what you're trying to do with the technologies uh, that are available to you. Again, this is probably uh, well known for uh, everybody on the call, but I just want to make sure that we, we're all starting from the same uh, page and, and understand sort of the, the terminology that we're using, right? So generally, when you talk about database, there is, there's, there's these ideas of, of scale up versus scale out. Um, shown here is a standard three-tier architecture, um, and it's well known that for the, the web or app tier, that sort of the stateless processing scale out architectures are standard practice, right? Um, Scale-out architectures have the benefit of uh, being able to dynamically address performance requirements on demand as you need them by just simply adding more processing, more uh, web servers, more app servers, more, more, more servers, right? So the graph on the right sort of shows as users and performance requirements increase or, or uh, sort of move to the right, your costs are linear with the, the, with the uh, increase in, in sort of users, right? Because as you get more users, you add more servers and your performance sort of stays the same as, as the number of users increase. For databases, for traditional databases, um, in, in sort of this three-tier three -tier architecture, the, the relational database is, is a single node, single process system that is commonly scaled up when uh, trying to address performance uh, or scalability issues. Right? And then the graph on the right sort of shows the cost versus performance um, 
when scaling up. Scaling up works up to a certain degree, but then the, the cost of adding more CPU, more memory significantly increase and performance either stays the same or sometimes can degrade depending on the type of contention that you're having uh, in, your, in your database and in the workload, right? So the, the, the state of the art for, for most applications that, uh, that exist out there today is this sort of three tier or, or N tier architecture with, with sort of a, a scale out architecture at the web and app, and app tier, but a single node scale up architecture for, for relational databases. This is again standard architectures, and, and and again in today's world there is a lot of shift to microservices and Kubernetes in general. And while this architecture is sort of commonplace today, the the newer and sort of modern architectures leveraging Kubernetes just adds yet another layer of complexity to sort of the the demands placed on uh, the database. This particular webinar is not going to sort of go through and touch on those com uh, complexities and issues around Kubernetes. Um, but it is something else you need to consider when you're trying to think about scale, your, your scalability of your database. So again, scale up. Um, again, most people understand uh, this is sort of common practice. This is sort of uh, the state of the art for, for traditional relational databases. As your, your, your data volumes and your usage grows, uh, to address performance issues is effectively throwing more, uh, throw more money at the problem. Right? Add more CPUs, add more memory, add more disk to the system to improve performance. However, uh, adding uh, server upgrades, so adding more memory, adding more disk, adding, adding CPUs uh, to a system requires maintenance. Right? So you need to take the server offline to, to add more or basically switch processing from one server to another server if you, if you, if you, if you uh, acquired yet a, a new server with more memory and more hardware. So these, these scale up uh, steps require maintenance windows. And in today's 24 by seven uh, world, those maintenance windows are very hard to come by. And so generally what people do is they size the database server for peak performance requirements sometime in the future, right? They don't wanna size a, a database server and then in a month or two months when, I've, when you've maxed out the server, upgrade uh, that server again. So generally, you think about a, a one, two, maybe three year horizon for your performance needs for your database server. Try to estimate what that's gonna look like in two to three years, size that, and maybe even double it for conservative uh, estimates. And what you end up with, with a database server that is probably 5% utilized generally, maybe getting up uh, to 10, 15% if you're lucky, um, and then what you end up doing is, is, is waiting for that, that demand to grow on, on your application uh, to increase the utilization, and then you can sort of trigger that, that whole server maintenance uh, process. But in general, you, you've got a, a very underutilized server for anticipation of performance requirements sometime in the future, which you may or may not get to. That performance, that, that that cost for that server and that sort of uh, low utilization is compounded by the fact that you probably have to buy a duplicate server for HA and yet another, yet another third server for DR requirements. So I've got three servers, the primary, which is underutilized, uh, awaiting for some sort of peak performance in sometime in the future, and my other two servers uh, are there for insurance purposes in case uh, I have a failure on my first server. The end result, again, as, as everybody knows in today's uh, market, you result in significant costs with underutilized servers and, and very high TCO. So scale out. Um, scale out is common practice at the web and application uh, tiers. Why can't we do it at the, at the database tier? Well, there's been a lot of new technologies as I in indicated in the uh, beginning of the, the slides here, right? There's been a lot of new technology advances in database solutions that now provide scale-out capabilities. So what are the advantages of scale-out from a database perspective? First and foremost is the idea of dynamic provisioning, right? I don't have to pre-provision uh, the database server for some future event a year from now. I can provision the set of servers that I need to meet the performance demands that I have today with enough uh, bandwidth just in case I get spikes. But I'm not over-provisioning and I'm not overpaying for, for, the, for those uh, underutilized resources. 
right? So that results in lower TCO. The other big advantage with, with sort of scale-out architectures is the notion of availability. Again, if you think about the, the, the web tier or the app tier, if I lose a web server, does that impact my application? Not really, right? Because connections that were on that web server are just low balanced to another web server, right? And the process just starts again. So from an application availability standpoint, in a scale-out architecture, the loss of a single node or multiple nodes does not impact availability of the application. The same is true for the database tier. If I've got a scale-out architecture, ideally that scale-out architecture also protects me from node failures. And so the, the advantages of scale-out are significant, both from a TCO and availability um, standpoint for, for applications. As I said, nothing comes for free, right? Databases are obviously stateful systems. Scale out requires the ability to distribute the data and workloads across multiple systems, right? And the, the, the single node database servers are perfect because everything is optimized in a single node and there's no other, no trade-offs required for, for that processing. The data is there, the processing happens on the same node. When you start thinking about scale out architectures, you now need to think about how that data is distributed across those nodes and how workloads are distributed across those systems. The various different scale-out architectures all have certain trade-offs that they make to provide the ability to do scale-out. Those trade-offs could be in the form of the consistency model, strict or eventual. They could be in how the data is partitioned, whether there is a shared nothing, shared all architectures. There could be latency trade-offs for transactions, depending on where the data is and where the transaction actually happens. All these trade-offs are, are inherent in the architectures that each solution provides. So as you evaluate and look at database solutions that provide scale, scale out, it's critical to drill in into sort of the, the fundamental architectures and the, the choices that those architectures are, are making and the implications to the, of those architectures to your application. So if we sort of think about categorizing the, the different scale out options that exist today, um, there is the NoSQL uh, space, right? So this is sort of, uh, again, a well-known uh, well-used architecture for for distribution of data and scale out and availability, um, but they do have certain trade-offs. For traditional SQL relational SQL databases, there is the ability to do read replicas, so scaling out at the at the at the for read workloads. There's also uh, well-known architectures for database sharding, and we'll talk through both those uh, architectural. Um, capabilities and, and solutions and, and trade-offs for those. More recently, um, there has been innovation in the database space around storage I.O., right? So there's some storage-focused uh, architectures that either use a clustering or a shared disk model or the idea of a distributed storage uh, I.O. model. And then even more uh, newer is the sort of concept of distributed SQL. There are solutions out there that provide automatic partitioning of data across multiple nodes, so it's sort of transparent to the application. And then there is also something called uh, durable distributed cache, where uh, it's, the data is not strictly partitioned, but there is a dynamic cache that's available for, um, for scale out purposes. So we'll go through each of these uh, categories and we'll sort of talk through the trade-offs uh, associated with each of these categories. So NoSQL, uh, again, uh, this is not new. People have been using it for five to 10 years uh, uh, recently. But again, if you sort of think about to where this, where this NoSQL movement came from, it was originally driven by the need to address the limitations with scalability and availability of traditional, either MySQL, Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, your traditional databases, your traditional relational databases, right? If you think sort of think about the back 10 years, uh, the social websites who were running their systems on either MySQL or some other uh, database uh, relational variant were struggling to scale those systems to address their user base, right? And for their use cases, 
they really didn't need either a relational model or they really didn't need the strict consistency that's required for, uh, for these relational models. And so they started going down this path of a distributed uh, database system that sort of uh, gave up strict consistency for more available and scalable solutions. There is a, there's a famous theorem out there called the CAP theorem. Uh, CAP stands for consistency, availability, and partition. Uh, it's well known and it basically uh, talks about when you have a distributed system, so when you have multiple nodes acting as a single uh, system, partitions will happen, right? So because I've got a distributed environment, I could have a network partition between any uh, grouping or multiple groupings of nodes. So the, the CAP theorem states that when a partition occurs, that system must, must choose to save either consistency of the data or provide availability of the servers. A, a lot of people sort of think about pick two out of the three, like so pick C, A, P, pick two of those out of the three. But a, a CA system, so if I pick, if I pick conti uh, consistency and availability, that system doesn't really exist, right? Um, so when you, when you start, when you think about the CAP theorem, you, you need to think about it as a partition will happen. And when a partition does happen, do I pick uh, consistency or availability? For strictly consistent relational databases, they pick consistency. And what that means is that if a partition happens, the nodes that are in the minority of the partition are automatically stopped or shut down. Basically, you lose availability in the areas where that the the, the nodes the minor, mi minority nodes exist. However, again, if you sort of think about the use cases, so let's think about Twitter, right? If 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 there's a partition in the Twitter network, is it better for somebody not to see the most recent uh, tweet? or to lose access to their Twitter account because their partition happened somewhere else in, in, the, in the network. For those types of use cases, it's better to make sure that the, the, the user has access to Twitter, and yeah, maybe they won't see the, the latest tweet, but what does it matter? They'll, they'll, they'll get it when the network uh, comes back and the, uh, the information will, will still be there, right? And so that's, that's the trade-off that NoSQL systems went after. They basically said, I'd rather have the, the service available than strictly consistent, so I'm I'm okay with either not seeing the most recent data or potentially losing some data in the, in the case of some sort of failure modes. Okay, so that's NoSQL, right? So they're they're trading off uh, strict consistency for uh, availability of the application. In the NoSQL space, there are a, a lot of vendors out there. Um, they are sort of categorized into sort of four different groups of of services. There's a key value store, graph, document, and column family, right? So again, each model is suited to specific use cases. Uh, if you're interested in NoSQL uh, architectures for your application, look through these different models and see what suits best for you, the type of uh, system that you're trying to build. As I said, again, uh, these, these, these NoSQL databases work well for certain types of applications. Common application uh, use cases include logging, social data, IoT, uh, real-time analytics, metadata management. So these are standard um, use cases for, for NoSQL databases. The, the difficulty comes when I've got an existing uh, application running on Oracle or, or SQL Server, and I want to go to a distributed architecture. A lot of people in the early days of NoSQL said, uh, NoSQL is the panacea, it's a silver bullet, it will solve all my database issues. I can move my, my financial, transaction financial transactional tracking application to NoSQL and I'm golden. Well, a lot of people have tried that and there's been a lot of uh, uh, battle scars and, and failures and people have realized, yes, NoSQL is good, NoSQL works, but it, depend it really depends on the use case. For applications that have been built around the standard asset transactions, it's very risky to convert to NoSQL, right? When you convert to NoSQL in this, in, in, for these types of applications, you need to rethink the consistency model. The application is responsible for making sure that the data they get back 
is correct from a consistency standpoint, right? Transaction, the database no longer manages transactions. Now there's some new, there are newer advances in some of the NoSQL uh, databases in providing transactions within a specific grouping of data, uh, whether by document or by, by part of the graph. Um, but in general, across the entire database, transactional transactionality doesn't really exist. And then from a performance standpoint, it's up to the application developers to code the actual uh, uh, queries that are being used. And, and effectively, your, your application developers become your performance optimization uh, mechanism. So if your data model changes or your uh, cardinality of your data changes, then uh, the application developers may need to retune or reconfigure or rewrite their queries to, to sort of take uh, account the, the data profiles that are being used uh, in the NoSQL databases. So moving away from NoSQL and getting back to sort of the traditional uh, relational databases, uh, the first sort of scale out architecture is, is read replicas. Um, this technology was originally developed to provide faster failover uh, in case the master failed. So if you again think back to the origin origins of this, this technology, I've got a single node, which is my master. It supports all my reads and writes from my applications. You do need a, a, another node for availability or de uh, disaster recovery. Data changes from the master are replicated to these, these replicas. Uh, a number of years ago, those replicas were what we called uh, hot standby or cold standby, but you could not access them. They were only there in case of failures. The technology's improved, and now databases allow read-only access to these hot standbys, right? So all the reads and writes are being actively managed by the, the, uh, the master node, but for reporting purposes or for other read-only queries, you can now access these read replicas and get some scale out uh, for these uh, read workloads. You either need to have a segregated uh, uh, workload, like a, a BI or a reporting workload separate from your application, or you need some sort of load balancer that automatically routes read-only queries to the, to the read replicas. This works great for uh, read-only workloads, but it doesn't address uh, scale out of, of a write-heavy workload. And there is still, from an availability standpoint, there's still an outage, right? If the master fails, one of those read replicas needs to be brought up as the master. So there's still a period of time where that read replica has to become the new master and there is processing required to make that the new master. And so there is uh, an outage. That outage could be brief, like seconds to minutes, but it could also be longer depending on the, the workload that's being executed. Another standard model for traditional uh, databases for scale out is something known as sharding uh, or database sharding specifically, right? What database sharding it does is it takes a, a very large database. Um, so basically a, a database that's grown uh, bigger than, than supported in a single instance and basically splits up all the tables in that database across multiple smaller databases. So in this example, I've got three tables, X, Y, and Z. And then I've taken uh, all three tables, distributed them across three different databases, and split the data in those data in those tables across each of those databases. So I've taken a very large database and split it into multiple smaller databases. Right? So that's known as, as sharding. There is a shard. Each shard is its own database. Right? Um, to do this. You need to ensure again to to to, to reduce complexity and 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 the, get the best performance. You need to have a workload that fits within a shard, right? So, for example, let's take a, a an application that has uh, customers, and maybe I can put each customer in its own database, right? That would work fine if the application uh, all the workload is, stays within a customer scope. If I ever have a, a query or workload that has to join tables across customers or a transaction that spans customers, then that becomes a lot more complicated, right? You need to think about two-phase commits across the shards. Uh, 
you need to think about how you coordinate those transactions across those shards and how I aggregate data across shards. Right? So sharding is, is a common approach and there's some newer technology out there to sort of automate sharding, but you still need to think about um, the workload and the implications of that workload across that shard. Also, from an availability standpoint, sharding does not do anything for availability. Right? Sharding provides scalability by splitting the data. You would then need to duplicate each database for availability HA and or DR requirement. And the last point, again, sharding is really dependent on the application. It's generally a static shard. Like it's, it's generally hard to dynamically add or remove shards from uh, a sharded database. And it's really dependent on how the application has been, been architected. The other set of, so that took us through the traditional architectures. Now I'm sort of focusing on the, the storage optimized uh, new architectures. While this is not really uh, that new, right? Um, clustered and shared storage is a storage focused um, uh, way to sort of think about scale out. This was, again, originally developed for um, availability needs, right? So if you think about that failover from a, the master to the, the read replicas, uh, the clustered architectures were effectively mechanisms to get rid of that, that need for an outage. So if I lose a node, there is no failover. The other, the other nodes in the cluster are still actively being used and can still support the workload, so there's no outage for the application. So this architect supports multiple, multiple read and write nodes. However, all the data is, shared, is, is stored on a shared disk architecture, so this is a shared storage architecture. Again, if you think about the read replica uh, model, it works really well for, for read scale out. You could do some write scale out in this architecture, but it has a lot of limitations um, on, on write scale out. The other issues with this architecture is, it does, is that it does require special, specialized hardware, especially on the, the shared storage uh, layer, and the interconnect between the nodes uh, sometimes needs to be infinite band. Right? So it requires uh, specialized architectures for the node-to-node the -node communication for, for high throughput and, and actually uh, memory management. Common examples of, of this architecture are Oracle Rack and IBM uh, PureScale. Again, not that new, but uh, newer innovation in, in the whole uh, scale-out story for databases. More recently, um, there has been a lot of innovation going on on the storage layer uh, in what is known as distributed storage architectures. Again, this does improve on the read replica model, right? Again, this is mainly for scale out uh, of, of read replicas and availability, but it has significantly changed sort of the I.O. Um, uh, profile of databases such that you can actually do, a, a, you can scale out write workloads better um, for for these types of uh, environments. So the way it works is there's still a master, there's still a primary instance. The improvements to the I.O. allow that data to now be uh, distributed across multiple database, uh, sorry, data backends. In the case of uh, Amazon Aurora, it's uh, six copies across three uh, availability zones as shown here in this, this, this diagram, right? And those uh, Database, the, the data is kept uh, synchronized, so they're always up to date. The databases in the replica environments are still only for, for uh, read-only, but the failover is very, very quick in, in, in these architectures. Other examples in, in this space include Azure Hyperscale. So that is, again, uh, the... the the, the storage improvements that have been happening. Now we're going into what I, I refer to as distributed SQL uh, innovations. So there's, there's two architectures here. Uh, the first one is auto partitioning, right? So there's some newer systems out there, uh, namely uh, Google Cloud Spanner and, and, and Cockroach and, and Yugabyte databases that automatically partition all the data across multiple nodes, right? So you don't have to worry about the partition, how, how to partition the database, you don't have to worry about the sharding models. Uh, they sort of, in the background, based on primary keys of the tables, automatically shard, or automatically, sorry, partition 
they did the data across multiple nodes. Typically, it's a three node replication scheme. There is uh, a master node where all reads and writes must go through for that partition. And then the data is then replicated to two other nodes for an availability perspective. In, in the diagram uh, to the right, the dashed line represents the, the master or what is known as the leaseholder for the partition. And then the other uh, two nodes have uh, copies of the data for availability. So the advantages of, of this architecture is that it's automatic, right? You don't have to worry about how that data is partitioned. So that's, that's great from an from a operational and ease of use standpoint. Um, the other things you need to think about, though, is um, there is still a, a master node right, for a partition of the data. And all reads and writes to ensure consistency must go through that master node. So as you sort of think about your workload and how it, the workload would work in a partitioned environment, the same still holds true, right? You still need to ensure that the workload is partitionable and that workload is being um, sent to that node where the, the, the partition is, is, uh, is the master, whether the node is the master for that partition. So you have to be very careful about locality of the master and the, uh, of the partition and the type of workload. If, you, if, there, if the workload is not very partitionable and or um, access to the, to the, the node is, is not in the, in the master for that partition, it will impact latency significantly, right? And so the trade-off here is, is scale out, but you will, you will generally trade off latency for that scale out architecture, right? The other potential issue is repartitioning. So if I've got a, a three node system and I add another node, then I've got to redistribute, I may have to redistribute all my data across that new node. Right, so that new node starts out as empty, that in order to, to take advantage of that new node, data has to be moved to that empty node. So repartitioning can be very costly depending on the size of your tables, right? And, or the number of tables, right? So if I'm repartitioning, generally I may repartition all my tables across those four nodes. And so if I've got, I don't know, a thousand tables, I have to go through every table, even if there's only hundreds of rows in each of those tables and repartition the data. So that repartitioning mechanism can be expensive and can impact uh, the ongoing workload that, that's happening on the system. The last architecture that I wanna sort of talk through here is what is uh, referred to as a durable distributed cache. This architecture sort of takes the, the standard uh, database architecture and and sort of splits it into sort of more more modern cloud architectures. All the other architectures I've talked about, the database process is still a single process. Whether or not there's multiple processes, it is still all the the, the query management, the query processing, and the storage management is still handled handled by the single pro same process. In in this architecture, what's happened is that the query processing is separated from storage management. So if you think about modern cl cloud architectures, compute and storage have been separated in, in most cloud architectures today. That is the same paradigm that we're using with this type of durable distributed cache architectures where the, the, the compute, the processing, the query processing is split independent from the storage management. What that enables, just like other, other modern cloud architectures, is that each of those tiers can be scaled independently from the other. So if I need more compute, I can add more query processing nodes. If I need more write scale out, I can add more storage nodes. Right? Again, because this is a scale out architecture, the data is automatically replicated between the storage nodes. Right? So you get both scale out without the need for partitioning of the data as well as availability of the data because it's automatically scaled out from a storage perspective. So that was a, a sort of a whirlwind view of database architectures, both from NoSQL to traditional SQL, traditional architectures, storage focused architectures, and sort of newer distributed SQL architectures. 
each architecture, each solution has trade-offs, right? You, you know, again, as I, as I said up front, in order to scale out databases that are stateful, you need to distribute data and you need to distribute processing of that data in an, in an optimized fashion. To do that, you need the architecture needs to will need to trade off. We're not nobody solved the speed of light yet. So if I need to get data from one node to another node for processing, there are trade offs that need to be happening. So again, as, as you're evaluating your the your database needs for your applications, review your use cases. Maybe you can get by with a NoSQL database, right? That that that's, that would be great if your use case supports it. If it doesn't, then you need to look at the traditional or newer architectures and look at the trade-offs that each of these architectures is making and understand your, your drivers and your needs to see what approach works best for you. This table sort of summarizes uh, all the sort of the, the, the stuff that we sort of talked through, both for the traditional storage focus and distributed SQL, right? Read scale up is the easiest thing to do. Everybody can do it. Right? It's effectively stateless, scaling out reads, right? So it is, it is the simplest thing to do. Write scale out, you need to again think about how I partition my data, how I uh, access that data, whether the workload supports uh, partitioning or not. And that's sort of what went by workload independent, right? So database sharding, as I mentioned, if I've got a workload that requires data from multiple shards, that workload is not going to scale very well. Same thing with auto partitioning, right? If I've got a workload that is not partitionable, that will impact my performance, my latency. That again leads into low latency, right? So the workload dependency and low latency are, are work hand in hand, right? If I want, if I need low latency for my application, then I have to be have to be considerate of how the data is partitioned and how that data is accessed. Generally, if it's um, a sharded or partitioned database and my, my workload isn't shardable or partitionable, then I'm going to give up low latency. The other piece to this is availability. Is the data replicated and does it does it uh, save you on the failover uh, processing for, for outages? Again, read replicas and database sharding do not provide any improved availabilities. All the other architectures provide significantly improved availability for, for failures. Generally, in, in any of the other architectures, there isn't. Um, there is a very low, in the case of a distributed storage architecture, or or no um, uh, failover requirements for for outages. Other thing to think about is commodity hardware, right? The clustered solution and, and, and distributed storage solutions are generally um, require specialized hardware. In the case of AWS Aurora, it only works in AWS, so that's it's it's specialized hardware for AWS only. Right? There are certain auto partitioning uh, systems out there that work on commodity hardware, and there's other systems that require specialized hardware. Specifically, Google Cloud Spanner requires uh, GCP hardware, which has atomic clocks and, and what they call true time to work. So you can't take that and run it somewhere else. And then complexity. Unfortunately, uh, the, the biggest trade-off for uh, a scale-out architecture is going to be complexity. The more you're going to have more nodes, you're going to have more processes, you're going to have uh, a larger environment in a scale-out architecture. The the complexity um, can vary, so sharding is is a very complex um, environment. Clustered and auto partitioning in, in the durable cache are sort of medium, and then the distributed storage and read replicas are, are generally lower complexity because they're relatively Simple to do because they're sort of read replicas um, re requirements. Very quickly, um, so that was an overview of the various technologies. I do want to introduce very quickly NeoDB. This is only going to be a very brief overview of who NeoDB is and where we fit in the in this sort of architectural scale out uh, landscape. Um, if you need further information, you can check out other webinars that are already recorded and online, or you can look at our, our website. So NeoDB is a distributed, architect, uh, distributed SQL architecture. Uh, we are part of that newer class distributed SQL classification. We support on-demand, scale out, and scale in. We do support uh, better availability, what I refer to as continuous availability because of our multi-node strategy. 
we use the, the durable distributed cache model, right? We have split the processing in between uh, uh, SQL processing as well as storage management. You can see that um, shown in the, in the uh, 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 diagram to the right here, where you've got your traditional single process, query processing, storage management, database processing, compared to NeoDB, where I've got transaction engines and storage managers that are separate. NeoDB support is cloud agnostic and cloud independent, so we support uh, clouds, multiple clouds. We, we have customers running across multi-clouds, so we have a customer running uh, a single logical database across uh, Azure and, um, and uh, AWS, and it is a standard SQL interface. From an availability standpoint, um, here's a common uh, 3TE 2SM model. So all three, all five processes look like a single logical database. The application can connect up to any one of the, the transaction engines and still have access to all the data. There is no sharding or partitioning here of the data. In the case of a failure of either a TE or SM, the application still continues. The, the, the connections to the failed node are rerouted to a, an available node and the application doesn't see the outage, still continues on just like as it was like a, a web, web farm failure. And on the storage side, because the data is already replicated, failure of, of a single storage manager has no impact to the availability of the data either. From a scalability standpoint, because we've separated compute and storage, we can scale out each of the tiers independently, right? So if I've got a read heavy application that is uh, like web or mobile, I can scale out my TEs as much as I want to, to address the, the, the read workload. For a typical OLTP read write uh, workload application, I can scale out both the TE and uh, storage layers uh, as needed dynamically. If I've got a write heavy workload, again, I can scale out my storage layer to, to accommodate for that write, that write heavy workload. And then if you're familiar with HTAP from, from Gartner, the hybrid transactional analytical processing uh, application uh, with NeoDB, you can, you can set up dedicated TEs for the analytical workload without impacting your operational workload that are running on the other um, nodes in the database. All right, so with NeoDB or with this type of architecture, you have a, a, a lot more flexibility in optimizing uh, database resource uh, resources to the actual workload that you have dynamically. So if there's a spike, you can increase one layer or both layers, and you can reduce those layer, uh, those, those nodes when that spike goes away. So from a benefit standpoint, again, it's a distributed architecture by separating compute and storage, um, colloquially referred to as an active-active environment. Every node in, in, in most distributed SQL architectures are available for processing both reads and writes. Again, depending on the um, architecture that you choose, if the data is partitioned and you access the node where the data doesn't exist, there will be a latency hit, right? And so that will impact um, your application performance. The biggest benefit for scale-out architectures is the ability to dynamically scale out to meet performance requirements on demand as you need them and the ability to scale that back in when you don't need them. So if you've got month of, um, if you've got additional processing at the end of month or end of year that you know you're going to have, you can scale out in anticipation and scale back in when you're, when you're done with that processing. Also, with most distributed architectures, uh, automation is key. This is where sort of Kubernetes comes in, the ability to sort of uh, run and operate the database through Kubernetes operators um, greatly simplifies uh, the, the complexity of distributed architectures. And then with dynamic caching, with, with NeoDB's uh, dynamic uh, cache, we don't require partitioning of the data. So in summary, um, there are a number, the, the database space is, is exploded, right? There are a number of options out there. There are a lot of options for people to evaluate, uh, to figure out what works best for them. As you think about scalability uh, and your application, think through the trade-offs that are, you need to consider uh, between consistency, transactions, uh, partitioning of the data, latency, and availability of your data. Each solution has different trade-offs. 
and dis uh, advantages and disadvantages. Look at your use case and figure out what works best for you. And again, UODB is a distributed SQL, and our target market, our, our, we've built this solution specifically for being able to migrate existing legacy uh, enterprise applications that are moving to the cloud or moving to a distributed architecture. With that, Sam, um, here are a, a, a number of resources that you can go to for next steps, and then I'll open it up for questions. Awesome. Thank you, Arif. Um, in the time remaining, we have a few questions for you. So let's start with this one. Um, does scaling work out any differently in multi-cloud environments than it does in a single cloud deployment? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question. Um, generally, uh, conceptually, no. Scale out uh, of of the nodes across clouds works the same as within a cloud. But um, again, you need to think about the workload that is going to be in each cloud, right? So if I've got a multi-cloud environment and I've got applications accessing the data and the database in both clouds, um, it may make sense to either scale up together if the workload is being um, increased together on both clouds or if one cloud is seeing more workload for whatever reason, whether it's locality or whatever, you may want to scale up the nodes in one cloud rather than both clouds. Um, how long does it take to start up a new node in a scale-out architecture? Um, unfortunately, I'm going to have to say it depends, right? Um, uh, as we sort of talk through um, the different architectures, if you think about the partitioned architecture, for example, if I've got three nodes and I add a, a, a fourth node in my architecture, that node is empty. It has no data, right? Um, I would need to redistribute data from the existing three nodes to the fourth node before that node can start processing uh, workload. Now, again, that could take minutes or that could take hours depending on the size of the data that's being partitioned. Um, compared to the durable cache architecture, um, if uh, a node is, um, if a TE, for example, in the DB architectures, if a TE is, is added, it can start processing data automatically, right? So it, it because it, the, that cache is dynamic, that cache is built up automatically, and if the data doesn't exist, it will automatically pick that data up from a, an adjacent node or storage, depending on whether or not it's cached already or not. So the time the time required to start up a new node really depends on the architecture, um, but there are some architectures that have uh, very low startup costs. Um, how much cost saves? Cost savings might there be from switching to a scale-up model or from a scale-up model to a scale-out model? Um, you could actually have a significant uh, cost savings. It's, it's going to be hard for me to say explicitly, but if I think about just hardware costs, right? So if you recall, when we talked about um, the scale-up model, I've got one node that's my master that's processing all my reads and writes. For availability requirements, I've got uh, an HA uh, server and a DR server. So I've got three times my, my capital expenditures to process whatever uh, application on one node. In a scale out architecture, if, even if I just have three nodes, the same three nodes, I'm actually utilizing all three nodes uh, rather than two of them being sort of um, uh, insurance. So at a minimum, like you can think about a 3x uh, capital cost, um, but with the dynamic ability, the ability to dynamically provision as needed, you can get significantly more larger cost savings with the scale out architecture than we can scale up architecture. Okay. Um, we have two more questions. If you guys have any more, you feel free to enter them in to the panel on the go to webinar control. Um, the follow-up question, does the distributed architecture of NuoDB work in a hybrid model where SEs and TEs are spread across on-prem and the cloud? Yeah, so uh, I think you meant uh, uh, TEs and SMs. Um, so yes, uh, NuoDB, um, because we're cloud agnostic, uh, we support what is known as hybrid or, or, or on-ramp, if you want to call it that way, where I've got a database deployed, a NuoDB database deployed on premises. Let's say, for example, it's got two TEs and two SMs on premises, and I want to migrate to the cloud. With other databases, it's generally a lift and shift. I've got to uh, bring up 
the cloud database, run it in parallel for a while, and then shift the, turn off my on-premises and switch over to my cloud database. So it's what I refer to as a lift and shift model of, of sort of uh, cloud migrations. With NeoDB, it's different, right? We've got a distributed architecture, so I can take my 2TE2SM architecture, add maybe just a storage manager in the cloud. So now I've got automatic replication of data between my on-premises and my cloud provider. And maybe I'm just using that for, for DR purposes. So I've got a copy of my database in the cloud. No, no workload there right now, but I got a copy and it's automatic. So now I've got a, an environment that is spanning uh, both on-premises and cloud, which is known as hybrid. As I get, as that, that environment solidifies, maybe I want to start moving workload to the cloud. So now I can deploy TEs. I can dynamically add TEs to the cloud infrastructure. So now maybe I have two TEs, two SMs in both my on-premises and on my cloud environment. Both are being, uh, applications are, are being served by both uh, environments. So it's what is known as active-active. And um, I've got access to all my data in both the cloud and, and uh, on-premise environment. So I can work in a hybrid and I can keep that model. Or if I want to migrate all the way to the cloud, at this point in time, I can shut off my on-premises. And now my applications are fully in the cloud. Right? So NeoDB has a, has a unique way of being able to migrate uh, smoothly to the cloud, uh, as well as support a uh, hybrid model, so supporting running both uh, across on-premises and in cloud. Okay. And the final question today, can you give an example of a use case or, or and the related requirements that would be a good fit for a distributed SQL scale-out option? Um, so applications that are, that are best suited for distributed SQL are applications that don't fit into a NoSQL um, use case, right? So. Again, traditionally, existing applications that have been written to work on Oracle SQL Server, MySQL, Postgres, who are, have been written, um, who applications have, have, have been written where it is assumed that the database has transactions, that the database supports ACID and strict consistency. Though those, if you're migrating from a single, single server, traditional SQL RDMMS to a, a distributed architecture, that's where distributed SQL uh, classification of, of databases shine. They are meant to be able to migrate existing work, existing applications to newer architectures. The, again, there's trade-offs between the different types of distributed SQL architectures, but um, if you're looking at sort of the, the requirements where one where one class is better for the other, it's really where you're, you're sort of migrating uh, existing applications. That's not to say we can't support newer applications that use distributed SQL. And maybe you're building a, a newer financial services application that requires transactions. You're not, sorry, requires transactions and, and through consistency. In this day and age, I, it'd be, it'd be I don't know, foolish for most customers to start with a traditional old school database. Um, they would look at a cloud database or distributed architecture, distributed SQL database for, for new uh, applications. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Arif. That's all for today. Um, thanks for the great presentation, and thanks to our audience for attending our session. Uh, we hope you found today's webinar informative and useful. Be sure to visit newodb.com for more information. Thank you again for attending. This concludes today's webinar.